G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel, continuing our series of uh, doing a little review or a profile, I guess, of each individual AFL club. And uh, in this video, I'll be talking about how their season went, breaking down their best 22, or at least having an attempt at their best 22, talk about their depth and potentially some, some strengths and weaknesses that I see in that team and potentially some ongoing list needs before finally a bit of a projection as to how 2024 might go. So uh, if you've been following along, I have been doing this in reverse alphabetical order, starting with the Western Bulldogs. And today we are up to the Fremantle Dockers. And I know this one's going to be a fun one because I'm a West Coast Eagles fan, which means you can be rest assured there's going to be plenty of bias. Like, first of all, the first things I would change is the jumper. Do they know that it's purple? No, but in all seriousness, no more jokes. This will be a dead serious analysis. But guys, if you are looking for the other content that I've done um, in this particular format, there's a playlist on the channel called uh, Team-Based Videos for 2024, and I'm gonna go all the way through to Adelaide, even though some people seem to think that I'm gonna give up before I get to the end of it. Before I crack in, if you don't mind, do me a favor and subscribe to the channel. Maybe chuck a like on the video, help me out during these off-season months. Um, there's obviously gonna be plenty of AFL content and some cricket content over the off-season as well. So do yourselves a favor, kind of. Do me a favor, please, subscribe to the channel. All right, let's talk about the Fremantle Dockers. Season 2023 was a, a bit of a strange one, I suppose, when you compare it to expectations. Uh, from going from 5th to 14th, they dropped 9 spots in the ladder. They had 15 wins last year, and they dropped to 10. So on the surface level, uh, you could say a failed season, although I think demographically with where Fremantle are at, I don't think it's quite that dire. I think there were some small wins throughout the year. It was just that uh, for whatever reason, things didn't quite click on field and they couldn't replicate the uh, the great form we saw in 2022, it has to be said. So on the one hand, you know, young lists, they, they continue to be one of the youngest lists, um, which is interesting. I kind of keep looking at demographics, expecting Fremantle to, you know, start ranking higher for age, but they don't. And, you know, part of the fact there is retention issues, which we've talked a little bit about on the, on the channel, players requesting trades. And they pretty much just bought into an entire list rebuild um, like seven years ago as well. So we're still seeing the fruits of that. Um, and there's plenty to like about this young quality squad. Injury wasn't the main factor for Fremantle, uh, not quite replicating last year's form, but it did hurt that Sean Darcy did go down with an injury. Uh, but like I said, there were some positives out of this year. I think the emergence of Jai Aim is probably the single biggest. Uh, probably the, the form and integration of Luke Jackson into this team as well, uh, I think is a huge positive when it wasn't really clear exactly what role he was going to have, but when he hits the scoreboard and kicks 22 goals or something like that, as a sort of ruck midfielder forward, um, you know, on, on output, you're going to be happy with that. Combined with Giant Aim is kicking 41 goals. That's That's been an issue facing Fremantle for um, pretty much since Pavlich retired. Uh, but now we're starting to see real growth in that area. And there were some individuals as well. Someone like a Hayden Young really caught my eye as well. Another player who's potentially transitioning into a midfield role, but we will get to their best 22. Yeah, like I said, it was a weird season. Some of the strengths that I thought Fremantle had last year, they couldn't uh, produce again in 23. Their ball movement looked a little bit hesitant at times particularly early in the season. Um, you know, I go back to that loss against North Melbourne in round two. They never really got their season going other than a mid-season run of form where they beat the Cats, they beat the Demons, uh, they beat the Swans too, I think. But for every really good performance, we saw some lackluster ones as well. So for Fremantle going forward, it's all about, you know, trying to produce that consistency. They found that in 2022, but they couldn't quite find it this year, despite the fact that Caleb Sarong had a uh, fantastic year. He won all Australian honours. Uh, and considering how young that kid is, he's, he's a really wonderful player. So broadly, let's talk about the list changes that we saw from Fremantle this offseason before getting into their 22. Uh, now, they had three players leave the club via trade or free agency. Uh, for Lockie Shules was a big blow. He's requested a trade to Collingwood. They've made that happen uh, for a future first round pick. Liam Henry did the same thing and requested a trade to St Kilda, and they got that done. Joel Hamling was the other one who left through free agency, although uh, not not really in the frame for best 22 like the other two were. The other two delistings were Nathan Wilson, or oh, three rather, Travis Collier and Eric Benning. So six cuts for Fremantle, which I think for a start is a big contrast to last year, where I think they, I think it was like 25% of their list were left last year. Not left, I should say, just cut. They, they changed 25% of their list, which is significant. So by comparison, a bit more of a stable off-season this year. Uh, and they, they went pretty much kind of money ball with their recruits this year. Um, in, for a start, we'll talk about Jeremy Sharp, who's a supplemental player, I think, the train-on player they've signed to their list. Obviously, there's a bit of a gap in the wing position. Oscar McDonald, I presume, is cover for Joel Hamling, who's left the list. A little strange one. I felt uh, Fremantle do have their own, quite a few key backs on their list, I would have thought. Uh, Cooper Simpson joined them in the draft, as did Ollie Murphy and Jack Deline, and I commented in a previous video that I think they drafted well on ter in terms of value for selection. It's another thing to say whether any of them are going to be good players, but I think value for selection, talent versus where they were picked, 
They did pretty well at the draft. Then they rookie listed a young ruck key forward, if I'm not mistaken, in Odin Jones. And uh, we should also point out that in this uh, little off season, they did uh, stockpile two future first round picks as well. Rather than trading into this year's draft, they decided to go for next year, which again is a, is a question in itself. So here is my attempt at the best 22. Bearing in mind, again, I am not a Fremantle fan, so uh, I am an outsider. However, I do feel fairly comfortable with this. I don't think, I think it's a fairly settled 22 other than a few spots up for grab here and there. I've certainly had more trouble with other teams and and as you can see well normally when I do this video I put the new recruits in yellow and I don't have any new recruits in their best 22 um, you know potentially for round one assuming everyone's fit this is what I went with so we start with a back line again fairly stable and I think um, a good mix of talls and smalls in that Alex Pierce you know he's a captain he's a good player Brendan Cox is a good player um, not necessarily all Australian standards either of them but still dependable key backs so you've got to be happy with that and like I said we'll, I'll talk a bit about later but they've got a number of key back you know depth options for them Heath Chapman I think is a player that really does have some potential at AFL level whether that's as a wingman or as a third tall defender. I think, you know, coming back from injury, probably keep it simple for him. So I've chucked him as the third tall defender. He's about 193 centimeters, or I think, but his development will be interesting. Luke Ryan's a lock. Jordan Clark's pretty much a lock too. And Brandon Walker was the other defender I have with Corey Wagner on the bench. Corey Wagner finished the season pretty well for him. Then there's a the midfield. It's, it's young, but it's strong. And that's not a pun. Hayden Young is in this midfield. I've picked him as an on-baller because I think that is the way they'll attempt to develop him this year. He did show some good signs there last year. So if they can harness his talent uh, in the midfield there with Brayshaw and Sarong, I think that that is a really high potential mix. Um, the other question mark on this team is probably the wing options. You'll see I've gone for James Aish and Matt Johnson, who I think both are probably, in an ideal world, primary on-ballers. But for a start, I don't have them starting in that on-ball rotation, and I still probably favor them to some of the other options. You know, someone like a Jeremy Sharp, I don't necessarily think is best 22 straight away. And Nathan O'Driscoll's probably a little bit behind the eight ball there as well. However, obviously over the course of the season, that could change. The forward line, in terms of the talls, this is arguably the best talls situation I've seen at Fremantle for a long time. Uh, we talked about Jai Amos, their best young prospect in the in a key forward sense since Matthew Pavlich. I think there's, that's already true. Uh, Josh Tracy as well, I think, is a decent second fiddle. Um, by no means an absolute mainstay or guaranteed to have a long career or anything like that. But I, you know, he's shown signs, and I think this dynamic can work. We already talked about Luke Jackson. Switkowski is a good impact. Small Walters still kicked 33 goals last year. So as far as smalls go, they're not too bad, although you'd like another dangerous one, just because Lockie Shaw's was such a good player. Nat Fife, I don't know where he starts in this team. Um, you know, he didn't play a lot of footy last year. Uh, you know, I'd imagine he gets picked round one. I'd imagine as well he's probably more as a medium forward. But, you know, um, that's not as, as simple a lock-in inclusion as it used to be uh, with Nat Fife. But he will start there. Bench options, I've got O'Meara as the next best mid. I'm pretty comfortable with that. Fredericks, the next best forward. Comfortable with that too. Neil Erasmus, I've decided to put in this team. Ideally not as a forward, but, he, you know, he'd probably rotate through there. Um, but I think his best game is as a midfielder, so I'd like to see him picked as a bench option through the midfield, but there's a lot of versatility there. Hayden Young goes back. Switkowski can roll on the ball. Nat Five can obviously play on the ball, as can Walters, uh, whether they go with that. There's also Wagner to consider. Sam Sturt I wanted to include, um, primarily as a forward. That's where I think he played most of his uh, game last year, but there was some stints on the wing that I remember, so probably my sub option there. But one player that I think is really unlucky is Tom Emmett. I think he had a couple of good games to end the year and he's, he's in the frame for this team. Uh, I just probably don't have him starting in round one, assuming absolutely everyone is fit. In terms of the depth options, I didn't pick Matt Tabiner. I picked Josh Tracy instead of him. Uh, so he becomes a tall depth. In terms of small forwards, I, I think Jack Delene is probably not too far off the team. Of, of their three draftees in Simpson, uh, Ollie Murphy and Jack Deline. I feel like Jack Deline could be the one to debut first. Just a little bit of a hunch I have. Um, their midfield depth, there's Will Brody, obviously Cooper Simpson, who they drafted, and then Sharp and O'Driscoll as the wing options there, or generally Sharp can play a bit of halfback. O'Driscoll could be, you know, an on-baller as well. There's Bailey Banfield to consider, Ethan Hughes, and then I presume Oscar McDonald's probably the first key defender back into this side. And just on the wing issue as well, I mean, I factor in players like Heath Chapman, probably even Walker and Jordan Clark, who I have on the back flanks there, as players that could potentially play wing. So the, the wings positions that I've picked there, I do think will change because I don't know if Aish and Johnson are necessarily 
wingman in the true sense of the word, but we'll see what happens. So after the best 22 segment, I usually talk about some ongoing needs and what I see with their lists. Um, it's not a massive deep dive into it, but just some surface level observations. I, I did note that I've taken a lot of key position defenders, not really in high picks. So Ollie Murphy went late. Oscar McDonald, obviously the listed free agent. I think that's how they signed him. Hugh Davies, I think was their first pick last year, but it was still like around about 40. There's also Josh Draper. So the Fremantle, I've noticed, do have a stockpile of developing tolls in pretty much every position, which is a pretty smart way to do it, to be honest. I do think they do need to unearth a genuine winger. So, you know, if we don't see O'Driscoll nail that role, Jeremy Sharp, they're obviously line ball. Um, then maybe that's one aspect they try and trade in because none of them are really as talented as Liam Henry, I would argue. The midfield's pretty sweet. I don't necessarily think it's deep, but I would suggest that the midfield itself is so young that it's not they're not looking for a transition by any stretch. Uh, but that being said, you know, Amir is not exactly, well, how old is he? He's going to be 30 next year. God, he's younger than me. God damn it. I don't know. I know they drafted Cooper Simpson there, but you never really stop drafting for the midfield anyway, do you? Uh, like I said, the key forward position is probably better than I've seen in a long time. However... There's been a bit of a link to Logan McDonald in this upcoming offseason. You'd be crazy to think Fremantle wouldn't be interested in that. Now, I don't have strong views on Josh Tracy either way, but you'd imagine Fremantle would be tempted by the possibility of Logan McDonald and Jai Amos. And that's assuming he even wants to leave. I just think that that's one um, player that they could certainly target. Other than that, they've still got three developing key talls uh, you know, behind those guys. There's Sebit Kuek. There is uh, Josh Corbett and, uh, like I said before, Matt uh, Tabana. And the Rucks position is sweet too. You know, Sean Darcy, obviously there's a little bit of talk as to whether he leaves. Not going to get into that right now. But there's Sean Darcy, one of the better ones in the in the game. Luke Jackson, if even if he leaves. And then Max Noble as well, I think, is a good young Ruck prospect developing in the waffle there. So I've mentioned a shitload of developing tools. Fremantle's got on their list. There's also Odin Jones, like I talked about, and Liam Reedy who are young developing tools there. So it's an interesting strategy there from Fremantle. Stockpiling lots of project players on their list and seeing which ones float to the top, which I which I respect. So in terms of an outlook for 2024, based on everything I've said there, there's still going to be one of the younger lists in the league. Um, so I'm not really too sure to what extent they have the burden of expectation this year, other than potentially a fan base that's a little bit sick of missing finals. Uh, I do think they're an outside chance for the eight. I think you can't ignore the form they showed in 22. And I don't necessarily think 23 is a sign of things to come. Uh, but I think this is probably more a case of uh, game style clicking, being executed well, having the right game style for a start. Uh, but uh, I think it's more about that than necessarily individual talent that we have on this list because I think there's a balance between talls and smalls, between backs, forwards and mids and ruck. Like there's no clear uh, personnel weaknesses that I think Fremantle have other than obviously the wing that we talked about. It's about the ball movement. It's about the forward connection, which arguably is going to be central to a wingman's role. But like I said, not down to individual talent lacking. I still think we'll see some upside from a very young group. Guys like Hayden Young are probably going to improve again. Uh, Luke Jackson's still going to improve. He's a tall, probably playing above what is expected for his age. Neil Erasmus and Johnson probably both still have um, some upside. Johnson, you know, had some really good form last year and Erasmus was a top 10 pick. And Chapman and guys like Walker, like these guys are still going to improve. And that's on top of guys like Brayshaw and Sarong who are still pre-prime. So there you go. There, that is a compelling case for why Fremantle will be a dangerous proposition in the future. It just It's a little bit murky as to how far away that is. But in terms of analyzing the list, the balance is solid. Yeah, they've got a few gaps, but who doesn't? Um, I, I would bet on them probably more likely missing the eight this year than making it because I feel like they're just a little bit harder to back than some of those other options I have. But if you told me Fremantle finished six or seven this year, I'd be like, yeah, I, could, I can believe that. So there you have it, guys. That is my take on Fremantle's list. Uh, let me know in the comments what do you think I got right and what I think what you think I got wrong. But also, like I said, we have made uh, these types of videos for well every team in the league up to Fremantle so far, and we'll be doing that all the way to the Adelaide Crows as well around the Big Bash content. So for now, I thank you for watching. I hope you subscribe to the channel because I want to get to 25K by the end of the year. Uh, but either way, have a good day, and I'll see you in the next one.